Als ik draai op de pro? Ja. Check. Met de wel even op de cijfers hier. En dat verder dan ook. Ja, deze zou dan uh, ja. de linker. Oké. Okay. Uh, dan kunnen we de audio sound sync. sync uh, Oké, okay, welkom al. Het is een uh, lecture on uh, Industrial Control Systems Security. Hm. Maybe I should have done a capital S there as well. Whatever. Um, yeah, today a lecture on, uh, on the, the, the security issues a little bit specific to industrial control systems. Well, what are industrial control systems? That basically all the uh, computer equipment used to, uh, in, uh, in factories, in um, cars, in transport, in uh, logistics, um, basically anything that isn't just a regular desktop PC uh, is quickly into the realm, goes quickly into the realm of uh, industrial uh, control systems. It's, it's, a, it's a very wide uh, field of uh, It's a very wide view. There's a lot of things going on there. For example, we have factories, like this is a production line. There's a lot of uh, computer equipment in modern production lines. There's even production lines that are totally uh, computer controlled. So there's, there's no human interaction uh, needed, necessary anymore. Car manufacturers, uh, manufacturing could be an example of this, where everything is uh, done by robots. Depends. I, I've worked in, uh, in a factory, in several factories here in Amsterdam, in the harbor of Amsterdam. And for example, the uh, factory that produced the uh, sunflower oil, sun, sunflower seeds oil, uh, there were six people per day in shifts of uh, uh, eight hours, huh? eight hours, three times eight. 24 hours, yeah. Three shifts, 20 of eight hours, two people per shift, we have six people for 24 hours. And they were producing uh, 600,000 liters of uh, sunflower oil per day. Six people. It's all automated. It's going on right now. Uh, probably still with the six people per day. It's amazing. And it's a, it's a huge plant. It has. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Five main buildings, production buildings, that I can think of which are in a line field. Because it, uh, the seeds are processed first. You have the, the seeds, and the seeds need to, need to be cracked, and they need to be pressed, and uh, then you, uh, you have the raw oil, and it needs to be refined, and you have uh, the, uh, the, the seeds themselves, the, the residue of the seeds that is pressed into pellets for uh, food, for animal, animal food, like your, if you have a, if you buy this bag of rabbit food, it has these little round pellets in them, they're like cylinder-like pellets, and they come from, uh, from that factory, maybe, they might, they might come from that factory. So there's a whole lot of things going on. And it's all computer controlled. There's different types of computers. You have the uh, computers that are uh, like, like the ones over here, which are, uh, they don't have a, have, a, have a keyboard, they don't have a monitor. It's, it's just basically a, a board with some logic, logic board. And it's called a, a PLC, typically, Programmable Logic Controller. And it, uh, it has input, analog input, Digital input. What's the difference between digital and analog input? What's digital? <laughs> digital is linked to binary. Uh, one, zero, on, off. Uh, it has only two states. On or off. Uh, one or zero. And digital input is, for example, uh, is the valve open or closed? Is the uh, door open, closed? Is there a flow, yes or no? It's a yes and no kind of input. 
analog input is, uh, has, has a lot of different possibilities. Truly analog doesn't exist in a computer system because computers themselves are digital, so it's always a string of zero, uh, ones and zeros, but uh, we can make the, the string of ones and zeros longer and longer and longer. Typically it's a, it's a 8, 16 or 32 uh, bit value from 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 and anything in between and we call it, we call that analog because you say why well, it's, it has a, it, it is not digital it's, 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 it has several levels. and you use that for example uh, level, temperature so I can say the temperature is about 30 degrees, 40 degrees, 50 degrees on a scale and of course with an interval it's, it's, it's discrete uh, it's not continuous but uh, still uh, we call that analog data. So we have analog input, uh, temperatures, uh, valves, open, closed. And we have a digital and analog output. Uh, digital output, switch a machine on, switch a machine off. Uh, or uh, analog, and analog I can, for example, set the speed. I can set a value, and I can say, well, it needs to rotate that speed, this speed, or this, or conveyor belt, at certain speeds. So that's typically analog output, and that's we call that programmable logic control because you can program it. Okay. Typically, you have some sort of interface. Or, they, they are not programmed like a normal, like a desktop computer, not in Java or anything. They are programmed in. Uh, typically with building blocks, like logic building blocks, by people who think in logic. So, uh, that block, and then this block. And, uh, there's even special type of uh, chips that you can use in the computer chips, IC, integrated circuits, you can use the program. Okay, and they're usually linked, they're, they're usually the interface between the hardware, between machines, and something that we as human beings can actually understand like a normal desktop-like computer interface with a screen and a, and a keyboard or keys, which you would see over here. And on this system we would run something which we would call uh, like a SCADA, a SCADA uh, application, and which has screens like this. I, used to, I started my career building this software, this kind of software. In, the, in these factories, I was uh, responsible for the SCADA software, uh, responsible for making sure that this worked and had the right interface. So it's a fantastic job if you can get it. It's awesome. Uh, it won't make you rich, though. Mm. It doesn't pay very much. It's, it's a lot of fun. A lot of stress, but also a lot of fun. With pumps, and you can switch a pump on and off, and it shows you uh, how, how much flow there is in a pump. And uh, it's, yeah, awesome. You call this a SCADA. Uh, interface. And then operators will say, oh, switch on the pump, and it will send a signal to uh, to the PLC, and the PLC will make all the switches and controls to uh, make that happen. Okay. Well, that's that's an industrial mm -hmm. control system. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. What? Uh, why is this? Uh, I don't know what's going on. First of all, I need to plug in the audio. Yeah, this is what I was uh, going for. Like. Well, first this one. This is uh, uh, a photo from the uh, United States, from the I think it was the Homeland Security. Is it Homeland Security? Yeah, Department of uh, Homeland Security, and they created a map to show uh, where all the vulnerabilities are in uh, the industrial control systems like uh, bridges, uh, traffic light systems, that kind of stuff, uh, nuclear power plants. Some people would say, well, it's, it's, it's <coughs> wise to publish this on the internet because maybe people with bad ideas might, uh, or with bad intentions might use this map to see, oh, they see this like some sort of shopping mall, and uh, oh, I'm gonna attack this. No, I don't attack this. Oh no, I, I can't choose which one to attack. Oh, uh, 
maybe here. Oh, there's so many, I can't pick one. Um, so, yeah, that's what some people fear. But the idea is from the Homeland Security, and I think, uh, I think Arnim and I are on the same line with this, that uh, not telling is like a security, but obscurity. So if we just don't talk about it, it's safe, because no one knows. That's not security, because the people with bad intentions will have a way to find out the information on this map by themselves, even without the map, if they want to know. If the Department of Homeland Security can figure this one out, uh, they can also figure it. Actually, we had a, uh, a lecture yesterday with the uh, uh, with Maltigo and Shodan. And with Shodan, you can just click it and click, and you get the same map. So it's, I mean, it's, just, it's, it's not even a minute to produce this map with Shodan. So we can, use it. we can do this. So it's, it's better to put this map online and uh, make people aware that, look, this is a serious threat. We have a similar map in the Netherlands, same discussion, about uh, how many people will be killed if a dike uh, breaks and uh, part of the, uh, the country is flooded. It's, it's a similar thing. If you, uh, if you have bad intentions, and oh, let's, let's destroy a dike, you can look at the map and say, ah, oh, I want to drown that many people, or that many people, oh, I can pick. It's the same, same thing, same, uh, exactly the same thing. It's also public, because they want people to know, to be able to know, do I live in an area which is under a high risk, or do I live in an area which is uh, maybe. As you can see, in America, you're pretty much screwed wherever you live. <laughs> because, I mean, there's not many dots here because there's no one living there. I mean, this is a, yeah. I have a video, which is not in, in it's in Dutch, but uh, I can explain in English what, what is happening here. Uh, it's running, but this, the audio is there. So, in dreigende overstroming beschermen gemalen en pompen de Nederlandse bevolking tegen hoog water. Ze zijn net als bruggen en sluizen op afstand te bedienen via internet. Dat gebeurt via een zogeheten systeem. Maar de beveiliging daarvan laat de wensen over. Zo lukt het om op afstand kinderlijk eenvoudig in te breken bij de gemeente Veren. Met het wachtwoord Veren. In theorie zou zo het Veerse meer leeggepompt kunnen worden. Vanaf uh, 2001 uh, waarschuwen we hier al voor vanuit TNO. Uh, vanaf 2005 hebben we uh, samen met Kema een rapport geschreven voor de overheid waarin uh, we op de gevaren wijzen. De gemeente Veren is op de hoogte gesteld en heeft maatregelen genomen. We hebben dus meteen contact opgenomen met de leverancier, die verantwoordelijk is voor het onderhoud en het beheer. Uh, en gezegd uh, om de boel op te lossen, dat is niet gedaan. Ik geef vervolgens weer een bericht, weer gegeven, oplossen, niet gedaan. Gisteren hebben we het systeem de stekker eruit getrokken, om het zo te zeggen. Eind december waarschuwde de Nationaal Coördinator Terrorismebestrijding over de kwetsbaarheid van dit soort systemen. Het NCTB zegt bezorgd te zijn en heeft de gemeente Veren inmiddels geholpen om de beveiliging op orde te krijgen. Ja, zo wat we zien hier is dat dit was een pump van een van de dijks in in de Nederlands en het was heel makkelijk om te controleren deze pump door een online interface. Het was linked to the internet en als je het paswoord gebruikt, dat was hetzelfde als de naam van de stad. You uh, would be able to uh, control the pump and uh, pump all the water in or out that we would like to do. Uh, of course, uh, in my opinion, this is, this is not as serious as it might seem. Because uh, let's say you would be able to uh, access that pump, then uh, if you would only use the SCADA, because there's, there's, there's more. There's different levels of attack. If you would attack the SCADA software itself and try to manipulate the SCADA software into doing things with the pump that might uh, might interfere with the normal operation of how a pump functions, you could, you could maybe do more and serious damage, as we will see in a later video. But 
if you just use the regular SCADA interface, all you can do is switch the pump on or off, basically, and maybe set the speed. But if you switch it on, they said you could empty the lake. I don't think so. Because if you switch the pump on, it will take a long time before the lake is empty. And I hope that someone will notice <laughs> that something is wrong before the whole lake is empty. And I think, uh, I, 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 I think the, the danger is not as big as they might uh, make it seem. But still, you can, do, uh, you can do a lot of damage. I mean, you could, you could have some form of flooding, but not the kind of flooding where people would drown, and it's very unlikely. Because the pump just does, just doesn't work. Sorry, it just just it just doesn't work that quick. It cannot move that much water at once. Um, so, uh, but still, it's, it's, it's scary because there are systems like uh, nuclear systems, which are also uh, accessible uh, over the internet in some cases, and in nuclear systems you can create a huge event within microseconds. I mean, if you, if you, if you push the wrong buttons uh, in the SCADA software of a nuclear power plant, it could go wrong. It could, get, it could get out of control within seconds. The whole Chernobyl thing happened within seconds. I mean, uh, so that, that could, can go very quick. And then it, there's nothing you can do. Even if you, if you, if you see that something is wrong, there's just no time anymore to uh, to do something about it, and you could have like a Chernobyl kind of explosion. Um, sadly, well, that's the uh, ICS uh, operator. This is uh, how how it might look. You uh, have screens. This is uh, Windows, I think, and uh, it's typically Windows for some reason. And this is, this is why the uh, ICS are typically very vulnerable, because they're typically very old systems. Uh, in these uh, factories, it is, uh, as, long as, it's, uh, as long as it isn't broken, don't touch it, because it's working. But the problem is, with software, it needs to be updated all the time. Because if you don't update it, then uh, it will, more and more vulnerabilities will be available to attack the system. And, uh, well, I, I used to be a, a system administrator for this kind of system, and I never liked touching it, because, I, I mean, real life example, here in Amsterdam, we had a, uh, the factory run two years non-stop, well, basically it never stopped, but uh, there was maintenance in the factory every, every other year, once in every two years there was maintenance for two weeks. And it was rolling maintenance, so the process consists of uh, of, uh, of of loading the uh, the seeds. They came from South America. Loading the seeds, then the seeds are crushed, and you make the pallets, and you get the oil out, the extraction. Then you have the oil, and then the oil needs to be uh, refined. It needs to be heated, and you need to uh, make it look nice and. Uh, they put uh, soap in there. They use a. Uh, if you have a, uh, all the uh, sunflower oil in all of Europe comes from the factory in Amsterdam. And if you have sunflower oil and you can look straight through it, then they use soap because that's the only way to get to, to, to get it clear. Mm -hmm. If uh, if you buy uh, sunflower oil and you cannot, I mean, there's there's little strings in there. It looks like a worm or something. Uh, it looks scary, but it, then they didn't use so. That's even that's better quality. But it looks if you if you put that in the in the Albert Heijn, no one uh, <laughs> people won't buy it. And the only way to get it out is with soap. Uh, so they put soap in, and then they well they take the soap out uh, more or less uh, with all the stuff. And then, uh, so that's why maybe you have a little bit of foam on your mouth every time you use uh, some water. Well, I don't know, there is soap in there. Uh, and um, quite a lot actually in the process, but they, they take it out uh, again. So that's the, way, the, that's the process of uh, how this uh, works. And then uh, first they start with maintenance here because they buffer. They have buffers everywhere in the process. 
So they start with maintenance on the uh, on, on this part of the factory of the production line, and then they can use the buffers to still produce in the other parts. And then uh, they can do maintenance on this part of the line, and they can still produce because they have buffers here, and they can start uh, start here. And they start filling up the buffers again from the start. So it's a rolling maintenance thing. So it has to run continuously. And there was this one uh, huge turbine, or I don't know what it's called, centrifuge, where uh, the oil goes in there, and it spins very fast, and it spins out all the all the stuff that's in the oil to, to get it out there. And it needs to spin at a very constant rate. It has, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a, a, a chemist, because the chemist now, well, what speed, of it, but it has to do with chemistry, that it has to be a specific speed, and then it works. So you can hear it, it makes all the noise. And there was this uh, wall, we had the, uh, P every building had their own PLC wall, and it was a, uh, it was a huge wall, <coughs> bigger than, than this uh, whiteboard, uh, all the way to the top, and it was all PLCs, all these little PLCs, and the PLCs don't have a keyboard or anything, it's just uh, wires and lights, little, usually green lights that flash. And whatever signals are going over the lines, you see the little lights flash green, which means everything is fine. Well, so, um, true story. We were happy. Machine, uh, the factory is running nice and we heard the machine. The problem with the big centrifuge is because it's steel and oil, it takes about a day to start it up. And uh, if you lose a day of production, that's 600,000 liters of production that you use loose and there's a there's a huge skip uh, because that oil goes all all over Europe it's it's the main factory for oil for uh, sunflower oil in Europe so it goes all the way to Russia to uh, Moscow uh, to Spain Portugal Turkey they all get their sunflower oil here from Amsterdam and it's a it's an American family owned business it's, it's not even a college family owned so that they are one of the richest people in the world. They, they control uh, some key uh, food uh, process lines. Um, uh, a carbon. And a uh, big machine. So if it shuts down, I mean, it's, 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 it's bad. Because uh, you don't want it to shut down. And the machine is running. And uh, the way the uh, software works, the way these uh, PLCs work, is they have, uh, they are redundant. So there's, there's one side of the PLC that's working and one side which is dormant. And you can mess with that side, you can change the software, and then with a the flick of a switch, you switch to the other side and you uh, have a new active system uh, running. So that's how the updates work. So that's how you can update all the software without interfering with the production. So th this was my colleague. I was working on the terminal, on these things, and my colleague was busy with, uh, with the PLCs. And uh, we had to update something. And uh, so, and he pre I, I, I'm there. I mean, we're a team. Uh, well, wow. at that moment, maybe not so much team. <laughs> so, well, we are teams. Right? Hey, buddy. Hey. So, and I, I see him press the, be the button. <clears throat> and the whole wall, <laughs> bam, red, all red lines. Oh, and <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, uh, my heart stopped. <laughs> And in the background, you hear the machine. <laughs> oh man, oh, that's scary. Scary, one of the most scariest moments of my life. And uh, sadly, he could, switch, uh, he could switch back to the original. And then you hope, well, but you don't know if you switch, what will happen. So you switch back to the original. And slowly, the wall, the wall started becoming green again. And you could hear the bit. <laughs> And uh, well, you look at the, at the screens mm -hmm. to see all the, the what the effect was, and uh, are we still running? Is, is, is the process uh, not inter interrupted? And uh, phew, things were uh, were good, but uh, th that that can happen when you update the system. So uh, I was never very happy when they said, "Oh, you need to install." And I was we were running uh, Windows NT4. <sighs> Crap! And I had it myself as well. That uh, I I. I I put a flop, we work with floppies, and I, uh, 
uh, the, the process was not running very. That, that's another thing. In uh, in SCADA, you work in shifts. I told you they work in shifts of eight hours, and so this guy had been working for eight hours, but the next shift doesn't take the the process. If the you, you see. Uh, the quality, you see all the lines, there's a graph of the quality of the oil, so you see the temperature of the oil, and you see, that's all the, the measurements that they do. And it should be flat lines, huh? like, 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 a, like the temperature of the oil, hey, so the, the, in, the ingoing temperature, and the outgoing temperature, and the soap that goes in, and the soap that goes out, and a lot, well, oh, I mean, that should be the same line, huh? So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, you see all these lines, and it, it's a, it's a graph, and it's a, so you see the lines, and and the uh, the, the operator, it's called an operator who oper controls the the, so the software, and uh, the idea is that the operator, the, the next one, he wants to see nice straight lines. He says, okay, everything's running fine. It's my responsibility to keep them straight. But what was happening was with it wasn't going very well. So it's like, <laughs> and they turn the knobs, and they're like, click, click, and put that up and down. But it, it's all connected to each other. So you put a little bit of temperature there, and then you need more soap, and you put too much soap, and ah, it's a, so the, the lines were like this. So the new operator said, I'm not taking this process. First you make the light straight before I'm, I'm signing. So that guy was still, Messing with his uh, finishing up with his shift, he's working for already eight hours. He wants to go home, and then the lines look like this. And I said, well, and I also wanted to go home. It's, it's, I, I want to go home, and uh, I needed to uh, install a little picture on there because uh, I knew the next day they were going to install a new valve or something. And then, but I have to I have to put the valve first on the screen before they can actually put it there. Because otherwise they have a valve which they cannot control. That's a bad thing. So, and I knew that the next day they were gonna put a new valve in there. So I said, well, I only need to put a, the picture up there. Right? It's, it's little. So uh, I asked him, can I, uh, can I please update the screen? Because then I can go home and uh, And he was like, how long is it gonna take? And I said, look, man, it's it's like one minute. One minute. And it's boom. So uh, he said, okay, one minute. So I, true story, again, I, I put the floppy in there, bang, blue screen. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, there's a, now, 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 now my heart rate goes to 500 because uh, uh, th this computer controls the whole process and it controls the PLCs. And if the, PLC, if the PLCs figure out that the system has crashed, then the POC will automatically shut down the whole plant because the, then the plant is running without control. Now there is a backup, but now the other anti Microsoft is, is, is keeping the whole process alive because if this one dies also, then the, the POCs will automatically shut down the whole plant and uh, because it has no controls anymore. So now I'm sweating my heart rate. <laughs> And uh, so I'm rebooting, and and the computer is still uh, counting its memory because it uh, you do a reboot and it is still counting the memory. And he said, "Are you almost done?" I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> so it took 15 years of my life. Uh, so yeah, you don't want to mess with the software on SCADA. But you have uh, interfaces like this. It's a lot of fun. It's, it, I can really recommend it to uh, if you can get a job in SCADA for to do it a little bit. It's, you learn a lot about computers and uh, systems, but uh, yeah, sometimes it's scary, and it doesn't pay very much. That uh, doesn't pay very well. You see a process. This is a uh, one of these uh, wind turbines for electricity. Um, you see that um, it has gearbox, and uh, you can see the wind, and you can see the temperatures and the speeds and how much uh, uh, electricity it creates. Embedded. There's a lot of uh, embedded uh, hardware in, uh, in, in in all these uh, equipment. In all this equipment, this is this is called embedded computing. Right? So it's it's, it's hit, the computer is hidden in some sort of hardware, like a tram. Uh, there's all sorts of 
computers in there. Let's look at some threads. We've seen, uh, we do this very quick because uh, we've seen all. Uh, the Morris War, we talked about it, uh, infected uh, 6,000 computers. The Israeli teenagers that hacked uh, NASA, Pentagon, US Air Force, US Navy, Israeli government, uh, and Hamas as well. The Filipino student that created the I Love You virus. Uh, uh, it led to the EU Global Cybercrime Treaty. In uh, August uh, 2003, Chinese hackers reverse engineered a Microsoft patch. This is interesting. What is reverse engineering? What is reverse? Anyone? Reverse engineering? <laughs> you know, that like, for example, a program you can like de destructure the program and know like what's doing, and what functions it's calling. Uh, yeah, you, you you take something apart to figure out how it, how it's done and how was it built and. Uh, so Microsoft, uh, they, they sent up an update, uh, they, 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 they said, oh, we need an update, we need a patch, because our software had a little boo-boo, uh, which sometimes happens at Microsoft. And, they, uh, and the Chinese, they, they looked at this patch to see what it was doing, and by uh, reverse engineering, they could see what the patch was actually patching. And then they assumed that not everyone and immediately install the patch, which happens sometimes. And then everyone who didn't have the patch installed, they uh, were attacked by these Chinese, uh, which was, this was the blaster worm, yeah, me too. Uh, I was also infected, but well, I, my machine was infected with the blaster worm. Yeah, so that's, uh, I know firsthand that it was a nasty, uh, Nasty little uh, piece of software. Other threats, 2004, unknown sources, probably from Russia, spreading the MyDoom virus, always the Russians. Uh, the fastest spreading virus uh, to date, with 10% of worldwide email traffic to contain the virus. 2004, a German student created the Sasha worm, also one I know. Uh, satellite communications down, Delta Airlines flight uh, canceled. Uh, the guy was arrested because he was ratted out by his friend. So the, uh, Microsoft, they couldn't find who did it. Um, and then they said, well, there's a, a quarter of a million dollar reward, which was still worth something back then. Um, and uh, one of his friends said, ooh, I'd rather have the money than that friend. So, uh, and he went to Microsoft and uh, he thought, it was him. That's about Diesel. Yeah. <laughs> Ewas. Ewas. Yeah. Heinrich. Heinrich Platost. Yeah. Um, in 2009, this Zeus Trojan was used to steal information from US government agencies, Bank of America, NASA, Monster.com, ABC, Oracle, Play.com, Cisco, Amazon, Business Week. Zeus is still alive today. It's open source. Uh, it's a very, uh, very uh, effective uh, piece of malware uh, to infect your systems. And it's a nasty thing. Oh, we had that yesterday. He said, "Don't go there because there was a, it has a Zeus infection." So yeah, uh, the X hamster. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, don't don't go to xhamster.com. I think it was. Huh? Yeah. It was uh, it infect your computer. Uh huh. Uh huh. Um, uh -huh. 2009 variants of Zeus were used to infect around 3.6 million computers and steal 70 million dollars. And it's not only software because there is also a lot of money stolen by skim. Well, not so much anymore, but uh, there used to be. Some historic uh, events: 71 experiments with worms. Uh, 71. That's 10 years because before the IBM PC. That's why to place it in context. 74. Animal, a uh, Unifact Trojan, copy to all uh, directors, we know what the Trojan is. <coughs> 1980, a thesis by Jurgen Krauss, self reproduction of programs. And again, it's the Germans, huh? 1980. Uh, self reproduction, so this is basically a, a worm, a worm virus. 
kind of thesis. A1, <coughs> the L clover, the first apple, uh, apple virus, boot virus. A boot virus is a virus that uh, is, is on your system um, during boot time. So it gets on your system when, it, when your system is booted. It, it is activated when your system is booted. So somehow it's, it's in there. <coughs> 83, RFR, a DOS Trojan, deleted all your files. Always a nice thing to do as a virus. Uh, a paper by Ken Thompson, a Unix C compiler backdoor. This is a very nasty one. So, a compiler, C compiler, C compiler is what, what, what was used back when men were men, women were men, women, uh, the good old days, I don't know, the good old days, but at least back then, before Java, and uh, what other wimpy langu languages do we have right now? JavaScript, and HTML, and C with uh, pointers, which can really mess up your software. I, I, see, I see faces of uh, that there's no, there's, there's not a many. Are there any people here who program in C? Yes, no? Oh, yes, some, yeah. But like, you, I think you, those who only program in Java probably have never seen the uh, null, po null pointer uh, error, which is uh, a very famous one. If you program Java, you see it quite a lot the null pointer uh, error. Uh, it's a nasty little thing. A compiler is a program used to uh, to create your program. Sorry, you type your program in some, some sort of source language, and you use a compiler to, to put it into bytecode or machine code. And what he did is he, he altered the compiler so that if you use the compiler, your program would not only be translated from source code to bytecode. Or, or machine code in this, uh, in this case, but it would also be infected with the virus, or backdoor in this case. Um, egg meter, dot Trojan, wiper this to arf arf, got you. 85 sources were uh, out there, printed magazines. I was reading one of these magazines uh, just the other day, and uh, there was a yeah, source code of a virus, it was fun. So I remember playing around with viruses in those times, in those days as well. Um, they were not really scared about viruses; they, they didn't take it seriously um, until the Cascade virus. Uh, they, in '87, we got memory resident link viruses, which, uh, uh, which are <coughs> much more difficult to detect than boot viruses. Boot viruses are pretty easy to detect. Because the boot, uh, the boot sequence is a very uh, well-known uh, sequence, and it's very easy to detect if something goes wrong there. But a, a link virus is linked to you to any software, and a resident memory resident is that it stays in the memory as long as the computer is switched on, and that's a lot harder to detect. So this is where viruses get uh, get, get dangerous, and. This one is even encrypted. And what's the thing with encrypted? Why would it be encrypted? How does a virus scanner work? How does this virus scanner detect whether a virus is... Looks for a signature? It looks for a signature. And if I encrypt it? You can't see it. No, it has a different signature every time. Because you encrypt it each time you infect something, you re-encrypt it with a new key. And it's... Uh, it will be very difficult to spot that way. Because of Cascade, IBM starts the enterprise development. I don't think we saw this video yet about uh, Cascade. Hello everyone, today we're taking a look at the Cascade DOS virus. This is one of my favorites, just due to its ingenious payload. So we'll go ahead and run it here. Now the virus is present in memory and will infect files. So graphics is now infected, DOS key, and it activates as long as the date is after, I think, November 30th, 1988. As long as the date is anywhere after that, it will always do its payload. So it's best to have a full screen of characters, and about a minute after you run an infected file, it will start displaying its payload, which is pretty cool. So, uh, I don't know, what should we do while we wait for it? 
combo out. We were on the format for no reason. Just a bunch of executables to affect them. It takes one minute the first from. time. But after it has run one time, once, the next time it's on uh, it's it's each falling time is on the screen. Makes it find individual letters on the screen and then move their position down as far as they can go without hitting another letter. And then after it does it for the first time, it will keep doing it every 30 seconds. And computing is impossible while it's dropping the letters on the screen. And so it's really entertaining, but pretty annoying if you're trying to get work done and all your work just keeps dropping at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> Wait for it to go again, we'll let it run its course. Oh, it also clicks the PC speaker while it does it. So every 30 seconds, all the planets would fall down. That's pretty annoying. Wait for it. <laughs> Wait for it. Wait for it. 30 seconds is long, huh? We'll do it with a little less tech so we don't have to wait as long for it to finish. There we go. Not sure if you can hear that or not. several war networks, 88, and Morris War, we already discussed it, Ghost Ball, multi-part virus, one half polymorphic virus, and polymorphic virus is uh, even, it goes even a step further than encryption, it uh, changes its uh, code, its actual code, so it goes a step further. Microviruses, 95, that's when the whole Windows 95 thing came up, and Office, uh, which Office, what's that? Office 95, no, Office, I can't remember, Microsoft Office, what number it was, but the Office for uh, Windows uh, 95, and you could uh, do all sorts of uh, programming in it, with Visual Basic, VBA, a Visual Basic application in your, uh, uh, in your Word, for example, where you had automated mailing lists and things like that that you could copy. Within that day, Olay object. I don't know. It's called Olay. I remember. And you could you could copy data from your Excel sheet to your Word. You can have a mailing list in Excel because that's apparently a database according to Microsoft. Uh, but you could make a mailing a, a mailing list in Excel, and then you could make a macro, and it could create a letter for every name in your database in Excel. Uh, it would fill out all the, the name and uh, yeah. Th there was access, but uh, somehow Microsoft always preferred. Well, I don't, I don't think Microsoft. I think managers prefer to use my Excel as a database because apparently that's a database. Uh, 
I, I agree. Uh, the, the access should be more considered to take place, although. Uh, concept, uh, microvirus, a lot of microvirus, uh, outlook worm, office worm, cock worm, <laughs> nice one. Uh, yeah, cock worm, yeah, really? Yeah, can it is, uh, uh, and, 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 and we're talking about a software worm. Right? But it's, uh, oh, a cock worm, look. My dog has cock worms now. Uh, this is software. Outlook worm shuts down Windows. C mile, Windows metamorphic virus, displays magic ma uh, message. These are uh, self uh, changing viruses, so very difficult to uh, find. 2000. These, uh, Windows Trojan creates a backdoor, and uh, Rust of C, which uh, is a rootkit. And we know what a rootkit is. I mean, we talked about it before. This is a list of uh, viruses. Just a uh, a list that goes on and on. Some of the names are nice. Ping pong, labor, exterminator, uh, bomber, Anakunikova, <laughs> Alabama, yeah. the uh, gay bird, bite bandit, <laughs> bite bandit, techno, uh, a list of worms. Boris Maidu, Navidad, Wiki, Zobot, the so big worm, it's a nasty one, Blaster, <laughs> um, and there's, a, there's another type called a logic bomb, and a logic bomb is typically uh, created by a system administrator for uh, to mess up the system if the system administrator gets treated badly. So for example, if the system administrator gets fired, we create a little bat, uh, batch file every Monday. That it starts automatically on Monday to uh, wipe all the data from the company. And if you are fired, then the next Monday everything is deleted. But as you can see, that could uh, that, that could result into eight years of. Uh, Un, uh, how do you say that? Uh, Unvoluntarily, involuntary, loving in a in a house with uh, bars. 2008, the Indian IT contractor, contractor Rajan Rashi Bhai Makwana. <laughs> Is there someone who speaks Indian in the room? Uh, planted a logic bomb to set, set to go off on October 24, 2008 to wipe all 400 servers of Fannie Mae. Uh, ah, bad Rajendranj, Pumbai, Pumbai, Makwan, bad. And the KGB allegedly placed a uh, logic bomb in uh, stolen SCADA software. Um, I want you. To, I mean, this is not this. I mean, this is, this is not disclosed publicly. They're not going to say, yeah, that's us. Uh, but apparently, the KGB they stole some SCADA software from pipeline to, for the pipeline uh, operation from uh, Canada. And when they uh, installed that software in Russia, in Siberia, apparently it blew up a line because uh, it had a logic bomb. That's, that's possible. Uh, yeah. With uh, law from America in this case. In this way. <coughs> what was the time? Mm -hmm. Oh no, from Russia with law. Huh? Mm -hmm. In this case it was from Canada with law. Mm -hmm. The types of digital threats. Virus, worm, logic bomb, Trojan horse, backdoor, mobile code, export. I think we all know uh, all these things that are here. Uh, a, virus, a virus needs a host. Mm -hmm. A virus is malware, that means a host like email or, or a file or executable. A worm is an executable that can operate on its own. It doesn't need anything else, it just uses an exploit and gets it. And uh, that's true of logic bomb, we just discussed this. Trojan horse looks like something, but it, which it isn't. So it looks like, uh, like an application or something. It might be even be the application, but it's actually a Trojan horse because it also carries 
a piece of malware. Uh, a backdoor is an open, is a, like a network or a password entry, uh, which you don't know is there, which is extra. Which like all the the BIOSes have these uh, typically have these backdoors for maintenance. So you can lock your computer with a password, but there's a password that is out there on the internet for maintenance that they can use to unlock it, like a, like a master key. Mobile code, code that works on any platform, like a macro, like a macro. Exploits, we will talk about that now, also has an interesting. Uh, key loggers, we will talk about it. Uh, spyware, we will talk about the others. We will come later. Botnets. Well, we, we discussed this several times before, so I'm, I'm sure you know what a botnet is. But uh, just to uh, recap, 2007, an example, the SRISB botnet generated about 60 billion spam email messages per day. Uh, about half uh, a million uh, computers created that, generated 60% of spam worldwide. So now that's a yeah. So uh, what kind of business do you have? Well, you know the internet? Yeah. You know email? Yeah, I know email. About oh, 60% of the email? Mine. Uh, it worked with command servers, command servers, we will talk about that. And when they were taken offline in, uh, in California, the worldwide email traffic dropped by 75%. So, uh, I remember the day there was nothing to do on the internet. Ah, my server was down. I, uh, I took a break. The, the botnet is still active. I mean, that's the thing with botnets. The, uh, they only get stronger and stronger. They don't really seem to die. In 2010, the Dutch police seized about, uh, I think we have a talk on this, don't we, Arne? On the botnets? Yeah, yeah we're still hoping we can get uh, Alex and Yoda. Yes. <coughs> who's famous for uh, taking down one of the botnets in the Yeah, that's this one, I think. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, a guest speaker. We tried to get the guest speaker again, who was actually involved in taking down this uh, botnet. Mm -hmm. so, uh, for least what? For well, Lisbeth, yeah. So uh, uh, we hope to uh, have him as well. But uh, uh, what he will tell you that uh, they took down a huge uh, botnet with 30 million zombies. And uh, in 2012, someone was arrested, the Armenian Grigory Avdonisov, um, and he was sentenced to four years in prison. I don't know, in Armenia, probably. I don't know. Probably not, not such a bad place to be if you have that much money. Uh, I don't know, typically in those countries. When you have money, it's not that bad. The botnet was rented, uh, was rented out to criminal rings. We will talk about it. Part of the botnet is still in operation with command servers in Russia and Kazakhstan. Yes. Uh, that's the problem with botnets. Here you see a list of botnets. This is just a list. Uh, here are all the botnet names. And uh, you see other names for the same botnet, or uh, types, variants of the botnets. And here you see the estimate number of uh, computers that they uh, that they control. And it ranges from 30 million to only a few thousand, uh, tens of thousands. But this is an old list, so it uh, it changes all the time. So. We hope to get a guest speaker on this because botnets are very interesting. They are uh, what to do. Just quickly, well, how do botnets work? It is uh, several several criminal networks working together. So we have a uh, uh, we have the network itself, and the network is in trying to infect other computers. That's what these books are. They're trying to infect new computer. To, to add to the network. Typically, the, uh, the computers are, these are called zombies or bots, huh? and they are under control by, uh, by, a, by, a, by a, in this case, a command server, a control server, control and command server. And these are, usually, when they are infected, they are just asleep. So you can do whatever you want to do normally on your computer. You can uh, play video games. Pew, 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 pew. Or uh, type your uh, thesis. 
do your homework, mm -hmm. uh, whatever. And, and, and in the background, uh, the, the software from the botnet is... Uh, and then uh, uh, they have a website up selling your computer. They say, we have Elmer's computer, it's this type of computer, uh, you can rent it from me, because I have control over that computer. And uh, these people, they, uh, they rent a number of computers from this botnet. And it's, it's just a web interface. So it's all automated, it's fantastic. So you pay, and instantly, typically instantly, you pay for it, and you get control over a series of computers. And you can do with it whatever you want. You do that on the website, it's like SCADA, almost. You say, ah, I want to, to do this and this, I want to install that. And then the control, the control server makes your computers that you paid for do whatever you want to do. For example, send email, spam email. And then they create spam. Typically it was used for spam, now it's used for a lot of other things as well. But you can do whatever you want to do with the, with the, with the computers that, they were, that, they, that are part of the box. And you can rent them for a day, for an hour, for a month, and do bad things, and make a lot of money. So this is, uh, this is typically how a botnet works. But it gets worse, because as, uh, as, your, as our guest speaker will probably tell, there used to be, that, that, that all the bots used to be sleeping. And they used to be listening <coughs> to a specific control server. And if you control the control server, you can do the bots, you can make the bots do whatever you want them to do. So what the police would do is, uh, is get infected. So basically become one of the bots, but, but, you, you, but you weren't sleeping, you were awake. Huh? And uh, you, were, you were checking, who is talking with me? Who is that talking to me? And, ah, you know, what is it? Anyway, and then the police would see, ah, that's the control server. And then they would go there, pew pew, and they would uh, uh, arrest that person who was there, and they would figure out who was there, and that's exactly what they did. So uh, they got smarter, and now there is no command and control server. Well, there is a command and control server, but it's hidden in the network. Now it's a peer it used to be a hierarchical network. So if you were here. You could go up the hierarchy, and you could figure out who was the boss. But now the boss is hiding in the network. It's just one of the bots. So you don't know. I mean, if you if you go back to the earlier picture, this one. Now the bad guys are here as well. So most of them are good guys. Oh, I like like we are right here. But. Uh, Hey, we are the good guys. Our computers are infected with the bot software. But, hey, man, I don't know. I know nothing. I know nothing. But uh, of course, we don't know who the bad guy is. Bad guy could be it. Bad guy could be me. But of course, when I, when I'm asked, I say, hey, I don't know. And it's it's very difficult now for the for the police to figure out because there's no hierarchy. Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? It's very difficult. It's uh, practically impossible, and this is why uh, there's 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 a lot of uh, uh, discussion going on whether uh, because the only way to figure it out or the only uh, uh, one of the easiest way to find out is hacking back through the network because uh, if you hack the software back try to figure out who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. But then you have to actively mess with the... It's not as simple anymore. It's just because it used to be a one-way... It used to be traffic from there. It would be very easy to track where the traffic is coming from. And now the traffic is coming... Well, if I'm here and this is the bad guy, there's no way to figure... It because these are all good guys. And I don't know. I mean, the data is coming and going to, from everywhere. So, I need to follow it back. I need to follow through the whole, I need to build a map of the whole network. 
And the only way to do that is to hack the network itself. So the only feasible way. And, uh, or internationally we would have to work together. Because the problem is that this network is not within one uh, country. Huh? It's not within one jurisdiction domain. It's not all in the United States. It's not all in the Netherlands. It's not all in Europe. I mean, this computer could be in the Netherlands. This computer could be in Kazakhstan. This computer could be in Russia. This computer could be in New York. So now we have a problem. And as long as all these countries don't work together, because if you have metadata, if I have data about connectivity over the internet, uh, or even though all these channels are encrypted, but uh, still, if I have enough metadata, I might be able to build a picture, but uh, then all these countries would need to work together and give each other, have them so, uh, share metadata and do research. Well, that's not going to happen the next few centuries. When was Star Trek 2500 or something? When we have the, what was it? United Federation of Planets? Something? When is that going to happen? Yeah, that's going to take a while before we get there. So, uh, and, well, then we have to. Okay. And it's not only software. There's also so, all sorts of hardware, like uh, all sorts of devices. I love this one. Used it a lot. Season interface. Season interface to uh, hack your uh, chip cards. You uh, check your. Ch your chip card goes in here, and this goes into whatever the chip card should go in, and you can uh, see whatever's going on, communication between the card and the terminal. And this is uh, typically not, not encrypted, because it's, uh, it's a standard, and it's basically the same communication as your mouse, your computer mouse. Uh, the communication between the chip and the terminal is all, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a standard serial connection. So that uh, you can use any terminal with any chip. So uh, you can do a lot of things. You can, uh, for example, you can see all the pin codes and everything. Uh, well, there's a video on the season interface, how it works. Nah, that's okay. Let's, let's skip that one. Uh, Keylogger is a piece of hardware. You can use to uh, select like a little plug. I think we talked about this before. A little plug you can put on your keyboard. If you have a keyboard like this, it has a cable. If you follow the cable, it comes to a little plug. And if you put that little thingy in between that plug, you can uh, see whatever is being typed on the keyboard. Uh, it, it will it will log it. And if you can see, this was done at Nordstrom. Nordstrom which is an American Froome and Dreisman Froome and Dreisman I don't know uh, an American version of a, a, a department store uh, and they uh, caught people putting that on the on the uh, cash register and why? because uh, these little thingies, these terminals are connected to the cash register, but they're not encrypted, again. So if you put a little key logger in between, you can see whatever they've been typed here, whatever. It's, you can just see, it's unencrypted. It's, 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 yeah. Because no one is ever going to tamper with that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've heard that so often. <sighs> uh, so no one is going to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, that's a key logger. Then uh, PIN in the Netherlands, here you see how they did, for example, at Albert Heijn. They uh, put this over there and this over here. And Albert Heijn was hacked in this one. And a lot of the terminals at Albert Heijn. And you would not notice and you would PIN, doo -doo 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 -doo, and it would copy uh, all the data. So, uh, also uh, ATM machines. You have, uh, I don't know, this is for, but you see they have all the <coughs> flash fake uh, fronts that they put on here with a little camera here there's a little camera there looking at your pin as you type it uh, and here complete fronts that they put on so uh, I have a video about the United States 
But of course, uh, it happens in the Netherlands as well. You know all about it. Huh? This is a nice video. You are watching what police say is a new breed of credit card thief called on tape. They say that guy is searching for a so-called skimmer device installed inside this gas pump in Arizona, stealing your credit card info when you think you're just paying for gas. What he doesn't know, according to investigators, is that he's just been caught in a covert sting operation. He put those in there, and for whatever reason, they're not there anymore. I know why, because I have them. He's the one who tipped us off. He's the one who switched out that skimming device for a night vision spy camera. We may have the first ever video of organized bad guys actually trying to retrieve their skimmers. That's video gold. Here comes our producer pulling up to buy gas. He swipes his credit card and for all he knows, for all the gas station owner knows, crooks could be stealing from him right then and there. The skimmer inside the pump silently harvesting his credit card information. He has no way of knowing. And this is now a multi-billion dollar a year problem. That's what I found mine. It was stuck up here. Unless you're looking like this, you can't see it. It looked like a little matchbox and that's it. It was stuck on one side to the middle. Ahmad Motley recently found a skimming device inside one of his pumps. He's been in the gas business a long time and played us some greatest hits from his surveillance video collection. Old men, they used to come in here with a gun or they used to break the windows at night when you were gone. But that is so last century. A skimmer wouldn't stick a gun in your face. There's nothing hiding his eyes. They will... Well, they'll rob you blind. The skimming device found inside Ahmad's pump sat there for months. He had no idea. Skimming all across this country was so bad that Steve Starrens and the United States Secret Service, yeah, the same guys who protect the president, they are now on the case. Are you winning the war? It's even right now. Uh, we're doing our best, but we certainly could use more help. They're getting help from police departments, tip-offs, from gas station owners, and just wait until you meet one of their secret weapons. Somebody uh, turned my partner in and he turned me in. Dan DeFilippi is a reformed credit card hacker. He switched sides. He was caught by the Secret Service and then spent two years training agents in the dark art of skimming. It's very easy and it's a lot of money. You can make tons of money. Gas station skimming is one of the easiest and best ways of doing it because it's hidden. It only takes seconds to open it up and put it in there. So this is the reader that would be inside the gas pump and so you would just swipe it through and it would read it right here. So you would just add this into the circuit? That's exactly it. What you would do is you would unplug this and you would just take the skimmer and plug it right back in. Nobody would know the difference. How do they get into those pumps? Believe it or not, there's a universal key that opens most gas pump doors. That's a universal key. The universal key. Um, it's the same key from uh, Massachusetts all the way to California. You can buy one online. And some of the newer devices actually use a cell phone network to transmit the data. So a bad guy can nab your credit card numbers without ever risking a return to the pump. Then, his option number one is to just sell your credit card number on a sort of eBay for skimmers. How much is my number worth? Anywhere from $5 to maybe $30. Jeez, not much. Are you nervous yet? Watch this. I would have an exact copy of your card. One swipe. One swipe, that's it. That is option number two, clone a card. And that's how easy it is to transfer your stolen credit card details fake card. I was printing my own fake credit cards and I would go to the store, purchase electronics, and I would resell them. So how do we stop guys like Dan from going on shopping sprees with your credit card info? Well, the Arizona Department of Weights and Measures is trying to stop this high-tech heist at its source. Well, we're gonna check in for skimming devices. And it was when they found a skimmer in this pump that they had their bright idea to lay a trap. They pulled out the skimmer and... We inserted one of these little night vision spy cams 
in the back of the dispensary. Here's the full video from their operation. 2 a.m. and a black SUV pulls into the gas station, picked up on the surveillance camera. Police tell us one guy blocks the attendant's view and two people punch over the pump. Bingo. Here's the view from that camera inside. A skimmer can, police say. And apparently a man and woman team caught red-handed. What we have here, we have the guy. And I have Mrs. Skimmer. It's awesome. They can't yes. find their skimmer and start bickering. So it's almost like a husband and wife team arguing about, you know, where's the car keys? The cops are still searching for Mr. and Mrs. Skimmer, but for our friend Dan, his crime spree ended when he was spotted shopping at a Best Buy with a fake credit card. So anything I wanted, I would just go out and get for free using these cards. But Dan's shopping sprees with counterfeit cars left a trail too easy to track. It's old-fashioned. These days, skimmers have a new way of turning stolen credit cards into cash. Huh? It's like a normal truck on the road. Yeah. Do you open it? Okay. Now it's not such an ordinary truck. I think this is about a 300-gallon container. Homemade steel. Doesn't look massively safe. No, not at all. After installing these huge hidden tanks, skimmer gangs go back to the gas station and fill them up at the pump, paying for the gas with your stolen credit cards. Look at where this guy has inserted the pump nozzle. It's up so high it can access that secret compartment. I would never expect someone to go to that much trouble. So well, it's, it's the next step. They then transfer the gas to a regular tanker and make what looks like a legit delivery to a crooked gas station owner. Voila, gas or cash. I'm gonna do an eight to ten million dollars a year. Eight to ten million dollars a, a year. The cops in LA County say they're pulling over trucks like this at a rate of one a week. So what on earth can you do to protect yourself and your credit card digits? Well, there's no point looking at the pump for clues. You would just never know. Never, there's no way of knowing. No way of knowing. While gas station owners are seeking new ways to protect their pumps, like locks and alarms, here are some other things that you can do. Check your account. Most credit card companies will suck up any loss if you report it within 60 days. Choose wisely. Choose a pump near the attendant. Skimmers prefer to target pumps in the shadows. And don't forget, you don't actually need to put your card anywhere near that pump. You can always Inside. So, yeah, it's, it's not only uh, not only software, and uh, it's not only uh, skimming as well. I have one more video, and then we uh, have a little break. This is. Uh, Goedenavond, een Belgisch-Nederlandse criminele bende hackte onlangs het computersysteem van het Antwerpse havenbedrijf en had zo controle over de hijskranen. De bende kon eigenhandig containers met harddrugs van een schip halen en op een oplegger zetten. In de Rotterdamse haven zijn hackers actief. De politie spreekt al over drugsmokkel 2.0. Het lijkt wel deze nog een soort James Bond film inderdaad. Het is denk ik ook de misdaad van de toekomst. Erik de Rijk van de federale recherche in België deed een belangrijke ontdekking in de Antwerpse haven. Bij containerbedrijven daar was iets merkwaardigs aan de hand. We hebben dus vastgesteld in een aantal zaken dat er werd ingebroken in die bedrijven, maar dat er niets werd ontvreemd. Integendeel, dat is dan iets tijd later aan het, aan het licht gekomen eigenlijk. Ja, er werd iets bijgeplaatst. En daar begint zo je wilt die speelfilm. Criminelen plaatsen in de haven apparatuur die informatie van computers kopieert. Ze zijn op zoek naar codes. Elke container die aankomt heeft een eigen eigendomsbewijs met een code. Wie de juiste code heeft krijgt toegang tot de haven en krijgt op verzoek de gevraagde container uit de hele stapel zo op zijn vrachtwagen gezet. Vol automatisch. Ogenschijnlijk legaal verdwijnt zo'n container met harddrugs. Een zeer praktische vorm van cybercriminaliteit. Dus die kilo's die zijn eigenlijk, uh, die zien eruit als um, een gewone USB-stick eigenlijk, waarbij je een in- en een uh, uitgang hebt. Zij waren voorzien van een uh, kaartje om gegevens hierin op te slaan. 
als ook voorzien van een uh, klein antennetje om die gegevens dan ook weer via 3G-netwerk te versturen naar de persoon uh, die ze had geconfigureerd. De criminele bende kreeg hulp van Belgische Wizkids uit de ICT-wereld. De founder of Argus Labs, waar een Belgische start-up wordt, een team van 9 developers, mathematicians en mobile experts, en are passionate about smartphone sensor fusions en big data. Verdachte M zegt er ingeluisterd te zijn. Maar de Belgische justitie stelt dat zonder zijn hulp deze geavanceerde computercriminaliteit niet mogelijk geweest zou zijn. Ik kan u wel zeggen, een opmerkelijke vermenging van, van onder- en bovenwereld. Um, wat dat de, de juiste drijfveren zijn geweest van die IT-specialisten, daarover is het onderzoek eigenlijk nog bezig. Dus daar, daar zijn we nog mee bezig. Maar het is, al aanvang, het is zeer opmerkelijk omdat het mensen zijn die eigenlijk totaal geen crimineel verleden hebben en zich dan toch hebben om zich in te laten met dit soort van, uh, van feiten. De haven in Antwerpen, Belgische whiskits, je zou denken een puur Belgische aangelegenheid. Vrij snel uh, leiden, onze, leiden onze onderzoekspistes naar de organisatie die zich in Nederland zou uh, bevinden. Dat heeft ons geleid tot uh, contactname natuurlijk met het Nederlands Openbaar Ministerie en een vorm van samenwerking op uh, til te zetten. Uh, die dan toch heeft geleid in een, uh, in een succesvol eindverhaal. Uh, een, een aantal arrestaties in België, een uh, zeer groot aantal arrestaties in Nederland en, en grote sommen geld en uh, wapens die in beslag zijn genomen bij een aantal verdachten. In Nederland zijn zeven verdachten aangehouden. Inmiddels kijkt het Openbaar Ministerie met meer dan gemiddelde belangstelling naar deze Belgische zaak. De criminelen hebben daar hun pakkans verkleind. Normaal hebben ze handlangers in de haven nodig, maar met deze nieuwe methode kunnen ze het vrijwel af zonder die handlangers. Er wordt natuurlijk zoveel geld geboden dat het aantrekkelijk wordt om mee te doen met dit soort dingen. Uh, in de meest recente zaken hebben we volgens mij bedragen gezien van rond de 70.000 euro voor één transport aan drugs. Dus dat is echt, uh, daar kun je lijk van worden. En wat moesten die handlangers daar dan voor doen? Niet zo heel veel bijzonders. Pasjes uitlenen, dat soort dingen. In de Rotterdamse haven zijn de ondernemers nu ook alert. De belangenvereniging van ondernemers beseft dat ook zij speelbal kunnen worden van criminelen. Ook hier kan dat voorkomen. Het komt ook wel eens voor. Alleen gelukkig niet in de mate waarin ik gehoord heb dat onze Antwerpse collega's ermee te maken hebben gehad. Het lijkt zo simpel. Je verstopt drugs in een container van iemand anders. Die container haal je op uit de haven. De drugs haal je eruit en vervolgens breng je de container met originele lading wel naar de eindbestemming. Geen haan die er naar kraait. Toch ging er iets fout. En, en de eerste stap was eigenlijk het, het versturen van updates waarbij dat je software matig ingrijpt en uh, bepaalde programma's installeert op de computer. Toen dat bedrijf zich begon natuurlijk te, te verdedigen en te beveiligen in hogere mate, is men overgestapt op fysieke inbraak. Het fysiek inbreken op de computer werd de bende noodlottig. Maar de methode is nu wel bekend. Als gevolg daarvan ontdekte het Nederlands Openbaar Ministerie dat ook in de Rotterdamse haven er een poging is gedaan om grip te krijgen op de afhandeling van containers. We hebben één aangifte gehad van een bedrijf dat ontdekt had dat zij doelwit waren van de aanval van een hekker. En heeft u diegene ook kunnen vinden? Uh, ja, die hebben we inderdaad kunnen vinden, maar die zaak loopt nog. Ik denk niet dat ze het logistiek gaan beheersen, maar het is wel een gevaar dat mensen gebruik maken van alles wat er speelt. En in de haven is logistiek nu eenmaal en informatieverzameling, daar gaat het om. Dat betekent dat je dus ook hackers zal hebben die proberen op die manier in te breken. In Rotterdam zoeken de havenondernemers en justitie nu samen naar middelen om die nieuwe vorm van criminaliteit tegen te gaan. Ik denk dat je bijvoorbeeld zou kunnen zeggen hoe kunnen we ons bedrijf beter beveiligen bij de poort. Het gaat natuurlijk niet alleen om de computers, maar ook om de poort, maar ook hoe beveiligen we de computers. Uh, welke mensen geven we toegang tot de computer? Alles wordt weer tegen het licht gehouden eigenlijk. Ja. We zien ook een uh, stijging van de pakkans. Uh, dat betekent aan de ene kant uh, goed nieuws. Want dat betekent uh, dat er dus meer aandacht voor is en de samenwerking, bedrijfsleven en overheid goed werkt. Aan de andere kant betekent het waarschijnlijk ook uh, dat mensen er meer mee bezig zijn. In de Antwerpse haven bleef de drugsmokkel lang onopgemerkt. Op het haventerrein merkte ze niets en elke container die aankwam werd uiteindelijk ook keurig afgeleverd bij de eigenaar. Zou het niet zo kunnen zijn dat Rotterdam, zonder het te weten, ook slachtoffer is geweest? Met de voorbeelden die we hier hebben, kan je eigenlijk wel zeggen dat de sky the limit is voor die, voor die kerels. 
Um, maar ja, ik ben ook geen specialist op, op vlak van beveiliging en zeker niet op vlak van beveiliging aan de Rotterdamse halen. Dus ik, ik durf daar geen uitspraken over doen. Maar als u de voorbeelden hier ziet, dan, ja, dan kan u zich wel voorstellen uh, wat dat er nog mogelijk zou kunnen zijn. So uh, we saw that uh, it's not only skimming, this is much wider than uh, just skimming. Uh, any type of industrial control system is, uh, uh, might be a, uh, a target for uh, malicious behavior. As you saw here, and it can be very lucrative because you control processes. In this case, logistics is, uh, was being uh, abused to uh, get uh, drugs uh, into the country, and uh, very effectively, as we saw. Um, okay, I would like to uh, have a short break. Let's say 15 minutes or so. Yeah? Okay. Let's see each other in 15 minutes. Oh, is it the most important? Yeah. Do you know that, Miguel? Oh, yeah. Um, okay, welcome back. Uh, let's continue. Uh, this was the video that we saw. Let's have a quick look at uh, the Stuxnet story. Because uh, Stuxnet was one of the most famous attacks on an uh, industrial control system. It was, a, uh, it was, it is, a nuclear enrichment facility in Iran. It, it, most of it is underground. So this is just a, let's say the elevator entrance uh, to, the, to, the, to the real plant. And they uh, got the technology through the Netherlands, uh, all the nuclear technology in the Middle East came from an exchange student, I think, from Pakistan. And uh, he stole some documents here in the Netherlands on how to build your own uh, sorry, okay. Nuclear technology for dummies document. Uh, no, no, no. He, uh, he stopped the document uh, telling uh, with, with, uh, with uh, how to, to do the certif certification and uh, enrichment of uranium and so on and so on. And this is how Pakistan and India got their uh, nuclear bomb and stuff. So, yeah. From the Netherlands, we love. Huh? So, uh, Stuxnet, I have a little video about Stuxnet. Deep in the heart of central Iran, the Natanz uranium enrichment facility is buried more than 70 feet below the desert, surrounded by thick concrete walls and guarded with anti-aircraft guns. The Iranians maintained it was to produce fuel for civilian nuclear power. But the U.S. and its allies feared its real purpose was the development of nuclear weapons. The West has long viewed the prospect of a nuclear Iran as a threat to be reckoned with. This issue has been a source of tension between the United States and the Islamic Republic of Iran. And then, one day in 2009, without a bomb being dropped or troops on the ground, the plant in Iran was dealt a blow. A silent agent carried out a seemingly impossible act of sabotage at the Natanz facility. Slipping past the armed guards, it shattered equipment crucial to Iran's controversial nuclear program. 160 centrifuges just breaking apart, metal shards flying everywhere, literally a shrapnel coming across the room. The agent of destruction? A computer virus, codenamed Stuxnet. And it turned out to be the largest act of cyber sabotage in world history. If you were in that room, you would literally die. You would not want to be in that room when this happened. Eric Chen is a computer virus expert who's been analyzing cyber threats for the last 15 years. He's one of the few people on the planet qualified to discern what actually happened. How big a deal is Stuxnet? I, I don't think there's ever been anything bigger. You know, the closest thing that's been bigger is maybe the advent of the internet. Chen works for Symantec in Los Angeles. It's one of the largest information security providers in the world. While its clients include multinational corporations, there's a good chance its software is installed on your computer at home, too. Last year, Symantec identified millions of cyber threats, but Stuxnet by far was the biggest. The company's team was instrumental in cracking Stuxnet. 
and what they learned will change the way countries approach warfare in the future. Stuxnet has basically demonstrated to the world that it's possible to take computer code and cause physical real-world damage. Stuxnet crossed over from the virtual world to the real one. The operation was so sophisticated, Chen and his team estimated it took more than 20 high-level programmers with inside knowledge of the plant and the tents. This is not through hackers in a basement in Kansas somewhere. When we know from the code and the sophistication and the amount of effort that needed to go into it, it had to have the resources at the level of the nation state. And in fact, the New York Times reported in January that Stuxnet was likely a joint project between the Americans and the Israelis. It's not a particularly shocking conclusion, considering that Israel has made little secret of its willingness to attack Iranian nuclear facilities by conventional military means. Stuxnet may have given them the opportunity they've been waiting for, without having to even fire a shot. But if it was them, they're not talking. The Israeli government did not respond to our request for comment on who created Stuxnet. We didn't have much more luck with the US. The CIA declined comment. The Department of Energy referred us to the National Security Council. They declined comment too. The Department of Defense and the US Cyber Command sent us the Department of Homeland Security, who referred us to the FBI. The FBI had no comment and sent us back to the Department of Homeland Security. But U.S. involvement in Stuxnet may have been cagely winked at, like when President Obama's representative on weapons of mass destruction spoke at a conference on Iran back in December. I'm glad to hear they're having problems with their centrifuge machines, and I think that uh, you know the U.S. and its allies are doing everything we can to try to make sure that uh, that we complicate matters for them. Symantec had to tackle Stuxnet because its business is to understand every computer virus in cyberspace. But even with Eric and his team of experts, the investigation spanned eight long months and became all-consuming. We'd go home and be looking at Stuxnet in our off time. You know, I sat in my bed with my laptop many, many nights over a very long period looking at Stuxnet. So here's what he confronted approximately 15,000 lines of computer code. These strings of numbers and letters serve as instructions which tell a program what to do. So from your perspective, I mean, how do you actually parse a computer virus? You know, when we get a piece of malicious software, when we get code, we get literally zeros and ones. And we basically decode them. We look at the numbers and translate them into behaviors. Do you know that it was targeting Iran by looking at the code itself? We discovered it was targeting very specific equipment but we didn't really, for example, identify that it was a uranium enrichment facility until four months after we had first with Stuxnet. And while it became clear that Stuxnet was focused on that one plant in the towns of Iran, how it got there was still shrouded in mystery. You may be able to trace it back to what all the epidemiologists would call it patient zero. Where did the infection start? But you don't know how that person got infected. Stephen Bellavin at Columbia School of Engineering has seen more than his share of viruses. He's been tracking cybercrime for decades. It did not attack its target over the internet. It was probably carried in by one of these flash drives. That's a portable hard drive, sometimes called a USB key or flash drive. The dominant theory is that Stuxnet started on drives like these. Spies on the ground planted them in key areas, maybe even spots like a parking lot. Places where people who worked at the towns, or people who worked with people who worked at the towns, might find them. Someone picks it up and says, oh, cool, I have a new flash drive, let me use it. When you do that with a Stuxnet, what affects your computer? So, let's take a closer look at how the virus actually works. For our purposes, let's picture Stuxnet as a kind of super saboteur. He starts on a USB drive big for a virus, but still a file so tiny that it's smaller than even one of your family photos, or MP3s. And as soon as he's plugged into any computer, he actually makes a copy of himself, he jumps off the key onto that computer. So you literally plug in a USB key for a couple of seconds, unplug it, and now that computer's infected. He gets into any Windows operating system, just like the one that's probably running on your computer now, and he enters undetected. You wouldn't even know that Stuxnet had jumped into your machine because he sneaks in using something called a digital signature. Imagine an ID card with your picture on it and your name. And using this ID card, the code can say, I came from Microsoft. 
that I haven't been tampered with and you can trust on from Microsoft. But what Stuxnet did was it stole some of those identity certificates from two different companies and basically signed its own software with those certificates. So when that software came onto the computer, Windows said, oh, this looks legitimate. You come from a trusted vendor and allowed Stuxnet to run. Now, once Stuxnet is loaded into a computer, it starts looking for ways to spread, ways out. Let's call them doors. It can spread in one of several different ways. It can look for other flash drives. It can spread to your file server. It can spread to a uh, print spooler if you're sharing a printer with other people. So Stuxnet can get around pretty well that way, but don't worry. He's not interested in breaking home computers. It's a carrier. Think typhoid Mary. She carried the typhoid germ. She wasn't sick for it. That's what your home computer would be like. It wouldn't slow it down. It might try to infect other computers, but it's not going to do any damage to your computer. Remember, the only computer Stux that's really interested in breaking is that one in the towns. He's basically looking for something very particular. It's basically a mini computer that's running factory automation. Stuxnet checks door after door, looking for that one specific computer that's so vital for the plant's operation. And this is the exact same model that would have been running in the facility that Stuxnet targeted. But this thing is smaller than a toaster. Yeah, I was actually surprised when I got it. I had never seen it. Believe it or not, you can just buy one online, which Chen and his team did when they were trying to get to the bottom of Stuxnet. It may not look like much, but this little module actually controls those centrifuges that are spinning up nuclear fuel. And when Stuxnet finally finds it, it begins unleashing destruction. Now, the centrifuges are already spinning near the speed of sound, but Stuxnet starts turning them even faster. Well, you're spinning the centrifuge twice as fast as it's supposed to go. Just think of uh, the tack on your car with that nice red line saying you're not supposed to run the motor more than 6,000 RPM or you'll damage your motor. And that's how Stuxnet destroys the centrifuges, essentially wrecking those very delicate, very expensive pieces of equipment. Isn't it one of the major jobs of a enrichment facility to be monitoring for for centrifuges spinning out of control? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's multiple safeguards. But Stuxnet gets around them. Stuxnet's pretty smart. It, it gave a fake readout to get, say, it's running at the normal speed, boss. It's not doing anything it's not supposed to. You've programmed it to do something, it's doing it, and you can look at your screen and see it's doing it correctly. And unknown to you, the motor is spinning twice as fast and damaging your centrifuge. So Stuxnet tricks the computer into thinking that everything is just fine. But people work at those plants, too. People with eyes and ears. The noise alone would be very abnormal, be extremely loud. And there'd be someone in the control room who would literally hear something going wrong. And they have a big red button, literally, to shut down the system. And Stuxnet would hijack that. So they would hit that big red button, Stuxnet would go, sorry, I'm running, and totally ignore the fact that the shutdown sequence has been initiated. Workers would have to just sit helplessly by as the enrichment process fell apart before their eyes. The story of Stuxnet turned out to be the first salvo in a new kind of war. It's a war that doesn't require standing armies or multi-million dollar fighter jets. Cyber war? I need a room full of computers. 20 to 30 people. How are you going to tell this from any other uh, office building with a server room and 30 programmers? There is a veil of anonymity in cyberspace. It is very hard to detect and track, and then, of course, to disrupt your adversaries. To better understand the impact of Stuxnet on the future of warfare, we visited the Naval Postgraduate School to talk with Professor John Arquilla. He's a former advisor to Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and he's the man who coined the term cyber war. Ballistic missiles come with return addresses. That's pretty easy. Uh, this is very, very different. Arquilla is worried that the next time a Stuxnet hits, it'll attack our infrastructure. Maybe it doesn't have to be a centrifuge. It could be the automatic controls on an oil pipeline. It could be something that regulates a dam or a nuclear reactor. And the fact that a policy choice was made somewhere to do this, to engage in this kind of attack against another, says that it's open season now. A big downside of a cyber weapon is that once you attack someone with it, their programmers now have the code. Now the Iranians possess that weapon and can perhaps re-engineer it. It's a legitimate fear. A survey by McAfee, a large cybersecurity company, 
supported the idea that militaries in several countries have done reconnaissance and planning for cyber attacks, mapping the underlying network infrastructure and locating vulnerabilities for future attack. They talked to executives from the energy, oil, gas, and water sectors about cyber risks in their companies. 85% of them detected some network infiltration in their systems. It's an arms race, and it's, it seems to be a never-ending arms race, and it probably will be a never-ending arms race. With tens of thousands of new cyber threats appearing every day, it's likely that the long nights Eric Chen spent on Stuxnet will not be his last. Every time we put new types of protection in place, attackers attempt to try to get around that. And when they do that, we then try to defeat them. It's back and forth and it's cat and mouse for sure. You too can embark on a top secret mission to disable a covert nuclear program. That's a game. So, uh, uh, yeah, so we see Stuxnet is a, is a, is a very advanced, uh, malicious uh, technique to uh, attack uh, industrial control systems. And as you can hear in the video, they fear <coughs> that it's open season now, so that uh, the, the, there's a very serious risk that our infrastructure, our uh, industrial infrastructure, is uh, vulnerable to this and uh, open to, uh, to, to attack. Uh, or sus susceptible to attack. Uh, who, who does that? I mean, who is involved in it? Well, of course, uh, if it's from uh, governments, it's agencies like the Central Security Service, the uh, NSA, uh, U.S. Cybercom, uh, Unit 8200 in Israel. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to get near, but it's that building over there. Uh, you can see them uh, hacking. Uh, and of course, in the Netherlands, we have our own AIVD, AIVD uh, who might be able to do that. In uh, the UK, uh, GCHQ, who hacked the webcam of uh, Yahoo. Russia, Fopsy, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> and uh, apparently they have uh, Canal Digital, <laughs> Dish TV, uh, because uh, they have a dish. In China, Unit 6198, which is the postcode or the zip code of the area. Uh, but apparently, this building is where the, the Chinese uh, NSA is, uh, is uh, housed. Let's have a little look at uh, Stuxnet. We don't need to go into too much detail, but it's interesting to see uh, what how how a sophisticated attack works. And like was said in the video, now we know that it was done, how it was done, and of course uh, each time the, uh, the group, the whole group learns on how to do uh, more effective uh, attacks. So now this is a very common technique. How it worked was uh, it targeted uh, Siemens uh, PLCs. Uh, uh, the PLC is the program that was your controller, like you would have in a standard factory. Ex the exact same model that I used, uh, that, that we had here in the factories in Amsterdam. I don't know if they operated, but uh, it's, it's, it's S7. It's a very common uh, computer, PLC. Payload is a PLC root kit. So it, 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 it buries itself deep into the PLC and it hides itself. That's what we saw in the video. Even if you would push the button, it wouldn't work because it's a root kit. And it, uh, uh, it, 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 would, it would make the PLC believe that everything is going fine. So it, it, puts, it places itself in between the I.O. and, the, and the, 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 the algorithms, the intelligence of the PLC itself, the, the, the software that's in there. So it will, it will appear to the PLC that every I.O. that's going on is fine. No one is pushing a button. Ah, the speed is fine. Well, perhaps speed problems. No problem. Rootkit. Targets uh, centrifuge controllers of the Iranian facility. First target is Windows. Because you, the, these computers don't have, typically don't have a connection to the internet. These computers typically uh, don't uh, have a keyboard or a monitor or whatever. 
uh, you you have a laptop and you look you hook up your laptop to the PLC and that's how you program the PLC. So that's uh, typically how you program it. So the first target is Windows. Second target is the software on the Windows machine because you have Windows and running on Windows is the uh, the programming environment for the PLC. I, I told you that's these little building blocks that you move around, drag and, uh, drag, uh, drag and drop, and uh, with all the logic, and it creates a program which you then uh, upload into the uh, into the PLC. <coughs> and it, uh, so, the first target is Windows. Second target is the uh, Step Seven uh, IDE, the software developed uh, kit on the Windows machine, and the third target is the PLC itself. To get in, it used an exploit, a well-known exploit in, uh, in Windows. And as you know, uh, as you should probably know by now, by all the uh, lectures we had before, an exploit is uh, uh, the actual use of a vulnerability. So a vulnerability is a, it's like an opening in your software, in your system, that, that is open. A, a, a way to get in and an exploit is the actual action or the actual program that uses the vulnerability to get into the system and uh, I, I put some examples up here a very famous one in the Netherlands where these uh, news sites here you saw your BNR radio and uh, the, the, one of the famous uh, newspapers in the Netherlands doesn't matter which one Telegraaf, Volkskrant, uh, whatever, Nu.nl all these uh, websites, they use uh, uh, advertisements, like here's an advertisement, and here's a little advertisement. Uh, is this an advertisement? No, that's not. This is an advertisement for the Samsung G600 Black uh, by now or whatever. And here, AIB. I don't know what kind of an advertisement that is because it's just for your letters, but apparently this is an advertisement. Uh, these advertisements were in uh, Flash, Adobe Flash, and it had a vulnerability. And what the uh, attackers did was create an ad that uh, exploited the vulnerability. And as soon as you, s as soon as the ad appeared, bam, your computer was infected. <laughs> that quick. And they, uh, they and the, these ads, all these ads on all these websites, come from the same uh, supplier. Uh, they don't. They don't buy their own ads, or they, they don't do their own ads. That's a there's a intermediate agency that handles all the ads for all these websites. So it's, this is just a placeholder. And what uh, what the, the newspaper sells is a place to put your ad, and they sell it to a third party. And same here, and they sell it to the same third party. So if you uh, as an attacker. If you manage to get your ad into the system, it will appear on all the websites that are affiliated uh, to uh, or are using this intermediate. And whenever your ad is shown, bam, infected, bam, infected, bam, infected, bam, infected, bam, infected. <laughs> and within, uh, uh, I think, they put it up, and within one or two hours, mm -hmm. Thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of computers in the Netherlands were infected. It was that effective. At, at lunchtime, everyone opens at least one of these sites to look at the news and bam, 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 infection, infection, infection. Very effective. Uh, I don't know if, we, uh, if I had the slide up, but they call this a watering hole attack. So uh, this, if, you, if you want to uh, hunt an animal, in, in like a, a desert, you don't have to go hunt the animal. You know that it's gonna want some water at some point, so you can just sit right next to the water and wait for it to come, and then bam, you have it. It will come to you, and that's why this is called a water, watering hole attack. Because if I infect those websites, I know that many uh, targets will go there. They will come to me. That's my exploit. They will come to me. Bam. I infect you. Bam. You come and drink my news. Bam. I got you. 
I own you now. Um, and it's easy. We already saw with all the scripts that are out there. The script kitty, we talked about it. Script kiddies are people who don't know anything about, well, don't know anything. Don't necessarily need to know anything about exploits and vulnerabilities. They just use some sort of tool to, uh, uh, to create an exploit and use it. Here you see a few tools and you can see whatever exploit you want to use or whatever program you want to uh, attack, which application you want to attack, in what way. We have our own Yen the White, Nunnally, who uh, used a worm generator uh, created by an Argentinian programmer. He created the virus within hours, so he wasn't that smart if you need a few hours to, uh, to use this tool. <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, but of course in the Netherlands he was offered a job by the government, a uh, security job, because they have no, in, uh, in, uh, we have a famous Dutch saying, in het land der blinden is de ene al koning, eh? in the land of the blind, he with one eye is king. And uh, I think that's that's this is very accurate in this case. Don't, wouldn't you agree, uh, Arne? Uh, There's two ways to become a professional security <laughs> yes. person. That's either by doing nasty things or yeah. by going to business and then. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And apparently we take the wrong long run. Yeah. Long run. Yes. <laughs> so uh, uh, black hole. I think I told I told this last time. This whole mm -hmm. black hole. Yeah. <laughs> what a black hole, huh? Uh, okay, uh, first spotted in uh, 2010, black hole is a commercial crimeware. Uh, it's a, it was an online thing, and for uh, 500 to 700 uh, dollars a month, you had the latest uh, exploits, and you could uh, hack whatever you want to hack. And for uh, 50 bucks a month more, you could even uh, encrypt your exploits, so they were more difficult to. Uh, to catch by, uh, by, by antivirus software. <coughs> this is the black hole interface. You could just uh, see what, tar what, what you would like to target and how you would like to target. And, uh, yeah. Well, this, this is some. Uh, uh, <coughs> this is just some uh, some statistics. There's other other uh, uh, kits. Uh, other. Uh, uh, tools like uh, Bleeding Life is another one. Uh, Dragon Pack is another one. Uh, cool, it's a cool one. It's a it's a whopping ten thousand dollars a month, but then uh, it has the latest. I mean, it's the absolute best. And if you make like seventy million, then, uh, who cares about ten thousand dollars a month? I mean, uh, and of course, uh, in the business of uh, crimeware, there's also crime advertising. Which uh, is like little ads for uh, crimeware. It says uh, advertisement selling iframe traffic in a huge amount. So that means uh, a huge amount of uh, effect, uh, infected computers. Uh, that's uh, the email address on ICQ, that number. Technical support, even. And uh, with an ICQ. And it's uh, here. Selling iframe traffic, no limits, 256 uh, countries, 24-7, loads for 8%. Uh, say the, the discount code, black hole, for a 5% discount on your first order. <laughs> it's uh, privatizing, fantastic. Well, the vulnerability timeline, I think we've seen this. We saw that, uh, well, this is something, well, I, I'll get back to it later. Um, the vulnerability cry, uh, timeline is about uh, uh, the, the birth and the death of, uh, from birth till death of the vulnerability. And this, this is the most important uh, period in the whole timeline, the so-called zero-day attack. The zero-day attack is very famous because that's, that's the most dangerous period in the whole timeline. When you create the software, right, when Bill Gates was born, no. uh, when, uh, when the software was created, uh, probably some vulnerabilities were introduced, but no one knew about them. They were there, no, they were there. Then at one point, someone uh, 
uh, uh, uh, uh, finds it and, uh, and, 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 and makes it, creates an exploit for it. So now there's only a few people who know about it and they, uh, they have an exploit. So they actually know that it's there and they're exploiting it. So <coughs> this is a, so, sorry, a zero day attack because most people still don't know it's there. So this is fantastic. If you're in this area as an attacker, okay, fantastic. Then uh, all of a sudden someone else finds out, and uh, this is this is one of the good guys, and and and, and the word spreads around. Hey guys, there's there's a, there's a vulnerability, and uh, maybe it's been exploited, uh, but uh, not until it is uh, it is known. It, it is made known to, uh, uh, to, yeah, to the end user, so to say. Uh, it's still called a zero-day attack. Because here only a few bad people know about it. Here a few good people know about it. But they haven't told me. And I'm using the product. So I'm still not protect. I'm still not aware that I'm under attack or that I'm vulnerable. And now it's publicly known, uh, released, that uh, that there is a vulnerability. Now everyone can know that there is a problem. So now it's not a zero-day attack anymore because now it, the world is out. So I know now uh, that it's there, and and I can start looking for it. And then we get uh, antivirus signatures and patches and. Uh, everyone has installed a patch, but this, this never happens. Well, practically never happens. I mean, maybe in the future, but uh, usually there's always uh, machines out there without a patch. And, and until everyone has installed a patch, there's still systems exposed. And there's, like I said, it's very typical that there's always machines out there that are not patched. Especially in the uh, industrial control systems. Like I said, because we don't want to touch these machines, we don't like that, we're scared from blue screens and so on. So, okay. Uh, so there's a window of complete, complete vulnerability and a window of partial uh, vulnerability. So, uh, okay, there's several ways. Well, how do they, uh, so they can get in through an exploit? They could also do uh, social engineering. Like that, uh, 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 Mitnick guy was very good at. Remember? Uh, yeah, that's uh, wanted by U.S. Marshals. I can enlarge it. Kevin, was Kevin Mitnick, huh? If I'm not mistaken. You want me to uh, make the sign a little bit bigger? I have it on another slide, a little bit bigger. But uh, he was very good at uh, social engineering. I like the fishing thing, which also works very good. Get people to uh, to click on something and do like a cross-site scripting attack. Uh, like or here, put a little link on uh, on Twitter or something and have people click on it. And, uh, one of the most uh, widely used attacks is the cross-site scripting attack. And the cross-site scripting attack is uh, um, to get you to execute a script, either on the server or the client, but it's very effective. And, uh, this is how the NSA hacked all these people, by uh, uh, sending out fake um, uh, LinkedIn invitations. So they uh, figured out who your friends were, and they sent out uh, fake uh, LinkedIn invitations to you with a link, and you clicked on it, cross-site scripting attack, bam, they got you. This is uh, very uh, well, you, well uh, known and used. Default passwords, big problem in uh, industrial control systems. These uh, most hardware come, come comes with uh, uh, standard default passwords and still there's still a lot of administrators out there that don't change them. 
I know. I mean, uh, I've worked in the field, and uh, it, it still happens. Well, I'm looking at Arnim. Am I mistaken? Sadly not. <laughs> not, no. Uh, again, with uh, Shodan, what we used uh, yesterday, is a great tool for finding out uh, devices on the internet worldwide with default passwords. So it's, uh, especially these uh, uh, NAS eh? systems, they're awesome. And people have all their private information on them and you can just access it. Well, I mean, you shouldn't. But, uh, wow. It's, uh, it's like uh, the, the speaker yesterday told, <laughs> bless you, uh, in the Netherlands for it to be uh, unlawful, uh, you need to go through something, some form of protection. And uh, there are even uh, NAS systems out there that have no protection at all. And then according to Dutch law, well, it, it, it's not really breaking and entering, is it? Or hacking, because I mean, you're just connecting. I mean, it's, it's they're open to the internet. Come and see my explicit pictures or passwords or whatever. Yes, uh, it's unbelievable. It, it, it's a shame they're allowed to sell it like that. I mean, it, it should be illegal. Uh, I'm looking at Arnim. Wouldn't you say that they should make some sort of law that if you buy something, it doesn't automatically put all your dirty stuff online? I mean, to me, that's something. Okay, I so. I was just actually, uh, now that you mentioned, I was just reading about the people happily installing a, an, uh, like a game on your phone, and it, in the end yeah. user license agreement, it says that they can mine uh, yes. Bitcoin and everything with your uh, <laughs> fantastic. Yeah. With your phone. No so. one reads it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's fantastic. Happy it's clicking. <laughs> yeah, happy clicking. Yeah. Unbelievable. Um, Target one, back to the uh, back to the Stuxnet. Target one, Windows. Well, they uh, uh, they got in by exploiting the, uh, uh, the USB driver. Uh, principle. There, there there were several vulnerabilities that they used. The USB drives exploit, the print spooler exploit, and the uh, SMB uh, exploit the, uh, the networking. Uh, software from Microsoft networking server. Uh, here's a lot of uh, information uh, how how they got in. Uh, they used remember in the video they had the, uh, the sign, you know that that that's Windows will only trust software that has been signed, and the uh, creators used the signing uh, signing key uh, of uh, Realtek and uh, J Micro. So they somehow how they got these uh, keys, and they were able to sign their software as if it were coming from uh, Realtek and J Micro. And these keys are trusted by Microsoft to uh, install software as a at the kernel level because they're drivers. Drivers under Windows that's a design flaw of Windows or Linux or whatever because they all have the same design flaw. Drivers need to be installed at kernel level. Otherwise, they won't work. Otherwise, they don't have access to the hardware. And uh, Realtek, for example, and J Micron, I think as well, is your internet, your network adapter. And uh, the driver needs to have access to the hardware and in order to have that access. It needs kernel level. So Microsoft, if, if it thinks it is, uh, it is software from Realtek, so, okay, that's the, that's the network driver. Fine, it, it, it may install. So that's how they were able to get kernel level access and then they own the system. You can install a rootkit. Um, yeah. And these are the specific vulnerabilities that they uh, used. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to look into it, but it's, uh, it's okay. We, we don't need to go into that in too much in, into too much detail. Target two was the step seven software. This is how the software looked. This is how you program a PLC. You drag and drop the logic Components, link them together, I/O, and then uh, uh, from this it will generate code for the PLC. So first it infected Windows, then it infected the, the, the software, and the third target was the PLC. This is actually the, what a PLC looks like. This is a modern 
PLC. And this is the old one. I recognize it. These are the ones that I also work with. This is the S7 PLC. That's the one that uh, we also used in the factories here. And this is a more modern version. Uh, a little bit more powerful. But th that's what, how, what it looks like. It's uh, basically a, a computer board with uh, I.O. And, and it's now, this, the, the old ones were like this. And each pin here is an I.O. pin to connect to a sensor or to connect to a, a button or a switch or a valve or whatever. And this is a bus like Ethernet, but then it's a proprietary bus from Siemens. Uh, Siemens. But uh, uh, this is like Ethernet and it can connect to, uh, to an I.O. box or a component that automatically hooks into this bus. And that's the cool thing. The rootkit of uh, the Stuxnet uh, installed itself directly uh, under the uh, bus driver. So it could control whatever, it could, it could control the bus. And as long as you didn't monitor the bus, you wouldn't be able to see what was going on. Because as soon as you got above the driver of the bus, everything appeared to be normal, because it's a rootkit. So uh, that's how they uh, got it. Uh, well, this is the Natal shirt, there were some pictures. This is the PLC. Oh. Uh, and uh, yeah, the root kit. So, uh, how it worked, the PLC has a, has a code. And uh, uh, Stuxnet would, uh, when the, when the, PL, when the uh, software was written, the, because of the root kit, inside the, uh, the, the software of the, of the, of the, the programming, uh, the, the Siemens uh, software, the Step 7 software, the, the software would be fine as long as it wasn't transferred to the uh, PLC. And when it was transferred to the PLC, it, it, it would change the code and load it into the PLC. And when it was read back from the PLC, it removed itself from the code. So even if you looked at the code on the computer, uh, after downloading it from the PLC, it looked fine. I don't understand. If you would disassemble the code that you actually sent to the PLC, you wouldn't be able to find it because it was gone already. That, that's, a, that's the cool thing about the rootkit. That's why rootkits are so dangerous. The, uh, and here you see the bus. Uh, you see uh, how that works. This is like the Ethernet bus. And you can connect it to whatever device, I/O things, and uh, or or program or uh, equipment that you can connect it directly to the bus. And only if you would monitor the the bus, you would see what was going. There you can see. There you would be able to see the virus, the Stuxnet. Uh, but only on the wire. Maybe uh, another interesting thing to add. If you go back a few slides to the. Uh, one. Yeah, this one. Yeah. So, which manufacturer is this? Yes. Okay. And in which country is this? Germany. No. Where was this picture taken? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Where? Where? Where, where was this thing running? Iran. Iran. Okay. And what kind of device? What was it used for? Combine some information. It's this is equipment designed for. Nuclear centrifuges. Yeah. Okay, so what is a German company doing in <laughs> Iran providing them with nuclear centrifuges? <laughs> Nobody finds this odd? No, it's just too We all make money. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody has heard of export restrictions, Wassenaar Accords, and so on. This is very curious. There was uh, so, some uh, interesting pressure was uh, applied to Siemens as well to explain how the, how they had this uh, yeah. equipment. And uh, I th if I don't, if I remember correctly, the uh, what was the name of the Dutch businessman that sold nuclear technology to Iran as well? Oh yeah, a while ago <laughs> in Pakistan. <laughs> We also have a, a nice history of this. Some yes, businesses and weapons to Africa, to uh, bad uh, <coughs> regimes in Africa. Yeah, but it, like I said, it's all about money. And uh, 
Yes, there are. Uh, Ireland is actually uh, is absolutely right. Uh, there's a lot of uh, export uh, uh, restrictions, and you can get convicted. I mean, you can go to prison. I mean, that happened with the Dutch guy. He, mm -hmm. he did go to prison. Even in the Netherlands, he went to prison for uh, uh, selling uh, weapons to Africa. And uh, well, they did a lot of that. Also, with the war in uh, in Iraq, I remember the first Iraq war. Then the Americans wanted to attack at night, so there was a Dutch guy who sold them uh, night vision goggles uh, mm -hmm. to the, Iran to the uh, Iraqi. The same thing happened in, uh, yeah. Ser uh, in Serbia, I think. Serbia, same thing. War. Yeah. As long as there's money to be made. Yeah. But, uh, well, didn't uh, the, I think that also World War II is full with uh, examples of this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this, this, this is the world. Ah, this is the world, uh, sadly, but uh, this is how it is. Uh, Duke U, Stuxnet uh, 2.0. A little bit later, they found uh, uh, a new version, Duke U, and it. Uh, this is uh, like a like a mapping of uh, the bytes, and we see that it's very similar. So probably it's from the same people. Uh, Duke U. Written in C, compiled with Microsoft Visual C, uh, 2008, with those options. Driver code is signed with a valid certificate, of course, uh, again. And, uh, uh, well, this is uh, where it was found. I mean, let's not get into a bit, we're, we're, we're a bit short on time. But it's very similar to uh, Stuxnet, but it's, 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 uh, it had a broader target, than it, it was targeted more things. The command and control, we now know what command and control servers are, the command and control server, one in uh, India, one in Belgium, one in Vietnam. And this was also true with uh, Stuxnet. They could also control Stuxnet. Right? So it was, uh, for Stuxnet, the command and control server, if I'm not mistaken, was in Denmark. So they, from Denmark, they could uh, control whatever was going on in, uh, in Iran. They could manipulate the pay payload, as it's called. Uh, yeah, you see the infected uh, countries, or targeted countries. The Netherlands was in the primary attack, and they attacked energy industry, supply chain, shipment, procurement, military, certificate authorities, hey, certificate authorities. So uh, the DQ, there's a lot of variants from DQ of DQ. As you can see here in the list, uh, all different versions. It uh, injected into uh, antivirus software. So this is uh, anti-antivirus technology, which uh, the worms and viruses are using. So they are trying to manipulate the uh, antivirus software to not recognize their uh, so the, the, all these products were infected by, uh, by Duke U. So if you had any of these, it would say, fine, nothing going on. So if you had uh, Kaspersky or McAfee or Bitdefender, Symantec, it would affect your, uh, your main, your, your virus scanning process and it would say, oh, that's not a virus, that's not a virus, that's not a virus. Oh, that's Duke U. Uh, never mind. Uh, that's not a virus, that's not a virus, that's not a virus. Yeah. Uh, command and control communication uh, went through blank G JPEG files, like you were browsing. And, uh, but it, it was giving secret messages to uh, Duke U on what to do. Okay, let's uh, go back to uh, ICS components. ICS components could be anything. It's, it's, it's a lot of different devices. It's like uh, computers are part of it, uh, as the uh, SCADA interface. Uh, it could be embedded things. It, it is all sorts of networking equipment. Uh, these PLCs and all these, uh, 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 all these intermediate uh, uh, hardware, like sensors and, uh, uh, and valves, things like that. You see wireless communication, there's a lot of wireless communication because you don't want wires everywhere in the field. It could be very simple hardware, which is in itself a problem because that means you have 
not so much power for encryption, for uh, uh, security, because you don't you don't have the heart. I mean, it's simple. But it's, it's it's more difficult. And another thing is custom made, which means you have to build your own security, and it's never a good thing. Well, never a good thing, but it, it's a, it's a, it's an extra challenge because uh, it means you're on your own. So it's custom made software, and a lot of these. Uh, like I said, I work in this field, and uh, I, I was shocked by, uh, by, 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 by the engineers behind the system. I, I hope it's better now, but when I worked in the industry, uh, typically these things were programmed by electrical engineers. Who knew, they know everything about the electronics. And then, ah, but I know how to program. It's basically electronics. Uh, uh, a computer is, is an electronic machine. But they're not educated in security issues, and so they they're they're basically amateurs when it comes to programming, and that's that's that, but that's why they make a lot of mistakes in programming. Yeah, they're very smart in electronics, but maybe not that smart in uh, programming. So this is and and of course, most software engineers they don't want to work in this field. First of all, because you don't make any money with it, and. Uh, Second of all, it's not very uh, sexy, is it? I mean, uh, it, it, it's not like like you can you can you can use it on a in a, a, a on a party or something. What's your work? Well, I program these uh, machines. And, so, what do you program? Well, basically. Uh, uh, oh, interesting. I mean, uh, it's, if if you say, well, I I I, I work on a kill zone. Hey, now you have friends <laughs> and girls. Huh? Even more important. Uh, but not with that. I mean, this, this is not the way to uh, get. I don't know. I mean, uh, but I don't think. I personally did not have that experience that I was. Uh, I was fighting off the girls. <laughs> uh, maybe it was not my my job. I don't know. But. Uh, I don't know. Uh, complex mix. This is uh, 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 ASML. Uh, we all know ASML from the machines that uh, create the wafers for computer chips. These are incredibly complex machines. So that is another factor that complex, uh, complicates the matter. They're, they're very complex. I mean, it's electronics, it's custom made. And some of them are 24 7 exposed. This is uh, software. Of, uh, uh, this was also, uh, I think, online, so you could connect to the Huiswaterbrug, apparently, in the Netherlands, and you could uh, sound uh, alarms over the bridge, uh, things like that. Uh, yeah, scary. Scary. That, uh, monitoring in the field, like I say, connected wireless. This is, I don't know, some sort of station that is monitored wireless. Embedded system, we already had that picture. What kind of uh, hardware do we use? It could, it, typically, we use uh, microcontrollers. Did you all play with like the Arduino or something? Mm -hmm. yeah. Some did, some didn't. Uh, the Arduino is an example of a, a, a microcontroller. A microcontroller is a combination of uh, a CPU and uh, memory and uh, some sort of uh, I/O chip. On a on a normal computer, on a normal computer, on a desktop computer, that is uh, three different chips. You have a, a chip, a computer chip, which is the CPU. You have a different set of chips, which is the RAM memory, and you typically have a, usually it's the South Bridge or something. Uh, which is the chip that does the uh, I/O for the keyboard and the mouse and things like that? In a in a microcontroller, all these components are put together on one chip. Typically, a very simple chip, but the, I mean it, it doesn't do that much. It's not that complicated. So here you see all sorts of microcontrollers. Or if you want to uh, go one step further, you would talk about uh, FPGA and FPGA. Is uh, like uh, uh, software is hardware. 
So you can program your own program, your, your software, like uh, whatever you would like to program. And instead of it being uh, in, like, like executed, like a CPU, you, you burn it in hardware. And this is incredibly fast, because it's hardware. It's, 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 it's turned into logic. And it's, uh, it's used more and more. Because